So I so appreciate you guys who email me and send me your, your questions and your concerns. And I hope that my responses to you are helpful. Uh, this morning I received an email from a sister who was subscribed to my channel and her question was, how do I rightly discern false teachers? I thought that was a great question and it got me looking through some of my older things. I have a, a whole hard drive full of uh, old, old clip excerpts and sermon bites and, and, and just great material from godly men that I've collected over the years. Some of these clips are almost 12, 13 years old. And I, I found one of the first, I guess you can call it a mashup of, uh, of pastors um, that I ever uploaded to my first channel on YouTube almost 10 years ago. And it's a mashup of John Piper, Paul Washer, and John MacArthur, and they're going at false teachers. And I thought, I thought that this would be a good, you know, entryway into dealing with this question. I also responded to the, the email myself, but I thought you guys would enjoy this clip. It's one of the, like I said, it was one of the first clips I ever uploaded to YouTube. And it's one of, I guess, in my opinion, one of my favorite clips. So please enjoy the clip. Your best life now. I will not lose sleep tonight. Worried about your best life now. I will not pray tonight for tomorrow, worried about their best life now, or whether they have self-esteem, or their checkbook is balanced, or they've got 40 days, or 90 days, or 100 days of purpose in their life. I will lose sleep because one day every one of you will stand before God naked and be judged, and some of you will be cast into hell. These are people dying. The wrath of God lays waste your community even as we speak how many people will be swept away even today by the wrath of God through death and hell. And you're worried about whether or not someone feels good about themselves? It's not about big ministries. There are some men here and I can call them by name have big ministries and they are going to die and go to hell. It is not about health. Here, I'm upset about the prosperity gospel because of an article in the Minneapolis Tribune about one of the big churches, 10,000 members, with the pastor having a couple of, you know, a jet and two big condos worth three million dollars in Florida and real estate everywhere, all over the place, and uh, gets breaks from his church so he's in trouble with the IRS, and it's just a mess, and I'm really upset about it because in the article. One of the leaders was quoted about being a salt. And I just hit the roof. I just went ballistic. What do you think the salt of the earth is? Well, you're the salt of the earth, but you know, how? Let's go to Matthew 5. Quick. Matthew 5. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experiment with you here. This is my exegetical uh, conviction, and you test it. I'm going to define for you the salt of the earth in terms of God is the gospel. Because I see that in this text in Matthew 5, 11 to 16. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. Now I believe that the reward there is Christ God ultimately. I believe in degrees of rewards in heaven, but ultimately every reward is leading to God and He is the final reward. So because we have an all satisfying, glorious, final, high treasure called Jesus Christ or the Father in heaven, we can rejoice in the midst of persecution. Rejoice and be glad in that day, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets. You're the salt of the earth. Now what do you think the salt is? If you just let it flow, let it flow. I'll tell you what it's not. Wealth. And here's why. Prosperity gospel is no gospel because what it does is offer to people what they want as natural people. You don't have to be born again to want to be wealthy and therefore you don't have to be converted to be saved by the prosperity gospel. When you appeal to people 
to come to Christ on the basis of what they already want, 1 Corinthians 2 makes no sense. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness to him. Therefore, if you offer to people what they do not consider foolishness in the natural man, you're not preaching the gospel. And the prosperity gospel offers to people what they desperately want as fallen people, gives it to them, and grows huge churches. And we export it to Africa and the Philippines, flying in with our jets, bilking of their money, and going back to our condos worth three million dollars it is horrific what we export as Americans I can't believe what we tolerate in the church so I'm on a crusade to crucify the prosperity gospel I hate the prosperity gospel because I love I love the glory of God now he says, he says something unusual about them. He says that they are like wolves. Their God is their belly. Their God is their belly. But they look like sheep. Now how is that? How is it that they look like sheep? By their flattering, smooth speech that in an age of tolerance makes you think that they are the men most full of love. They will never contradict. They will never be, they will never create a scandal. They will never be offensive. They will never speak forth things to anger men. But they have the smooth tongue of a serpent and they flatter men and they give carnal men exactly what now let me tell you something about false teachers. You think so many times that people fall prey to false teachers. And that, in a sense, can be true at times. But I think the dominant theme in Scripture is just the opposite. False teachers are God's judgment on people who don't want God, but in the name of religion, plan on getting everything their carnal heart desires. That's why a Joel Olstein is raised up. Those people who sit under him are not victims of him. He is the judgment of God upon them because they want exactly what he wants and it's not God. And you can line them all up along with him. That's where it is. Because let's go over. Let's just look for a minute at 2 Timothy. Just quickly. Chapter 4. Verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Now, when he says preach the word, what does he say? He follows it up with, be ready in season and out of season to reprove, rebuke, exhort. Notice that that is not what these preachers do. As a matter of fact, they boast in the fact that they do not reprove. They do not rebuke. It's not their ministry. And why do they say it's not their ministry? They have a ministry of love, they say. Well then are you saying Christ didn't have a ministry of love because he reproved and rebuked and exhorted and so did Paul. But now look, verse 3. For time will come, and this shows you that men are not so much victims of false prophets as false prophets are the judgment of God upon men who don't want God. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Who won't? The people, the religious people identified with Christianity. They will not endure sound doctrine. They can't endure it. They hate it. Or it bores them to tears. And so what do they do? But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers. Everybody in this world, I hope you know this, everyone in the world that is involved in Christianity knows that America is the birthplace of every heretical teaching on the face of the earth almost. You know what my greatest fear is? My greatest fear is that the wall around Cuba is going to fall. You say, why would you fear that? Because all of the heresy in the evangelical church will find its way into Cuba. 
I go into countries and some of the times they will tell me this, go back to your country and tell them please don't send any more missionaries. A few weeks ago there was an event here at Dodger Stadium with Joel Osteen. 35,000 people at Dodger Stadium, something like that. Um, he is now the largest quote-unquote church, uh, in, I'm using the word loosely, in America, down in Houston. Um, you need to understand that he is a pagan religionist in every sense. He's a quasi-pantheist. Jesus is a footnote that satisfies his critics and deceives his followers. The idea of his whole thing is that men have the power in themselves to change their lives. In his definitive book, Your Best Life Now, he says, and that ought to be a dead giveaway, since the only way this could be your best life is if you're going to hell. He says that anyone can create by faith and words the dreams he desires. Health, wealth, happiness, success, the list is always the same. Here's some quotes from his book, Your Best Life Now. If you develop an image of success, health, abundance, joy, peace, happiness, nothing on earth will be able to hold those things from you. End quote. See, that's, that's the law of attraction that's a part of this kind of system. Here's another quote. All of us are born for earthly greatness. You were born to win. Win what? God wants you to live in abundance. You were born to be a champion. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. Before we were formed, He prepared us to live abundant lives, to be happy, healthy, and whole. But when our thinking becomes contaminated, it's no longer in line with God's Word. End quote. By the way, God's Word is not the Bible. God's Word is that Word that comes to us mystically, spiritually, that tells us what we should want. Here's another quote. Get your thinking positive, and He will bring your desires to pass. He regards you as a strong, courageous, successful person. You're on your way to a new level of glory. How do you get there? Believe, he says, visualize, and speak out loud. Same exact approach. Words release your power. Words give life to your dreams. Here's another quote. Friend, there's a miracle in your mouth. I think Isaiah might object to that. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst the people of unclean lips. Here's Joel Osteen's prayer. I thank you, Father, that I have your favor. Wow! Did he meet the Pharisee in Luke 18 or what? I thank you that I'm not like other people. Here's another quote. I know these principles are true because they work for me and my wife. Oh, so that's the test of truth. Are you kidding? I know these things are true because they work for me and my wife. Sure, you're at the top of the Ponzi scheme. And then he said, even finding a perfect parking spot at the mall. <laughs> and I asked, what about the little old lady you cut off to get into that parking spot? What about her dreams? Maybe she was born to lose. I mean, it's so silly, it's so bizarre. He says, God has already done everything He's going to do. The ball's in your court. You have to take that part of God which exists in you and create your own reality. Now, what is the source of this? Where does this come from? Answer, Satan. This is satanic. This is satanic. This is not just off-center. This is satanic. Why do I say that? Because health, wealth, prosperity, the fulfillment of all your dreams and your desires, that's what Satan always offers. That's called temptation. Based on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's exactly what corrupt, fallen, unregenerate people want. That's why it works so well, right? 
You can go right into Satan's system, make everybody feel religious, and turn a, their desires, their temptations, into somehow honorable desires. I mean, what did Satan say to Jesus? Have some satisfaction. Why are you hungry? You need to eat. You need to be healthy. Oh. Why would you let yourself be unpopular? Dive off the temple corner. Who? Everybody will be wowed. You'll be the winner. You'll be the champion. You'll be the Messiah. They'll heal you. And by the way, if you just look over the kingdoms of the world, I'll give those to you too. That's satanic. And why are these false teachers so successful at what they do? Be because they're in cahoots with the devil. Why is Satan successful? Because his temptations, although they might appear noble on the outside, are in perfect accord with all the fallen, corrupt, selfish, proud, evil desires of sinners. This is a false kind of Christianity and a false view of God. And I think preachers like this, who preach this stuff, hate the true God. I really believe that. I believe they hate the true God and they are afraid to death that somebody might find out who he really is.